Bernard, the fine-tuning of the universe is something that physicists, philosophers, theologians are really spending a lot of time on. What is the primary issue and how can we begin to put it into perspective? Well, first of all, we need to understand what these fine-tunings are. And there are quite a number of them, so I'm obviously not going to go through them in great detail, but some of the fine-tunings involve the what we call the, the coupling constants, the, the, the constants which determine the strength of the four interactions, the, the gravitational, the electric, the weak and the strong forces. There seem to be remarkable tunings between those different constants, such that, for example, stars can form and planets can form, and such that you can have an interesting array of, of chemistry. Okay, so let's, just, let's give us that. Fine tuning is there. It seems remarkable. It, se it seems astonishing. We say it cries out for explanation. So what are the explanations? Well, if you're a, a conventional physicist, you, you would prefer to think that all the constants of nature were going to be determined uniquely, and you wouldn't then have to invoke any of these extra more metaphysical ideas. Um, and that was the hope for many years, and, and even with the ideas of M-theory, it was originally hoped that you would actually uniquely predict the constants. Now, if that was true, it would still be a mystery that the, prediction, the constants predicted did in fact coincide with the values you needed for, the, for, for life to arise. But in fact, it now looks as though that isn't going to be the case. M-theory itself does not seem to uniquely predict the constants. And uh, you know, we've got this idea that you might have 10 to the 500 vacuum states, in each of which you would have a different set of constants. And so, in some sense, the idea that you, you, the constants aren't uniquely determined, of course, predisposes you to the idea that, that there might be some sort of selection effect at work. The selection effect, of course, being that we have to exist. But then, sometimes that's, that's called the multiverse hypothesis, the idea that there are actually m many universes, um, and in all of these universes the constants may be different, and, and we are necessarily going to exist in, in, in one of the universes where the, the conditions for life are what they need to be. Because so, if we didn't exist, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, I, I rather like the, the analogy of the lottery ticket. You know, you buy a lottery ticket and, and you win, and you think, my goodness, that's one in a, a million. How amazing. But of course, once you realize that there are a million other people who bought the lottery tickets, it's not so surprising. And it's a bit like that. If you just face with this universe and you ask, how come I'm here? It seems to be like a one in a million chance. But if you think there are a million universes, then of course it becomes fairly natural. It's, a, it's simply a selection effect of the kind which we already know we have to take account of in physics. So, and I think because of the, the, the idea of the multiverse is now much more popular, both on account of developments in particle physics and on account of developments in cosmology, both of which in their own ways have predicted in some sense the existence of a multiverse, it now comes, it's now very natural to us think of the multiverse as the, as the explanation for these fine tunings. And, um, now some people would say that's absolutely for sure the explanation, full stop. You don't need anything more and that's, it's, it's kind of intuitively obvious and demonstrable that that's the case. Well of course it's not as simple as that. I mean when we um, first started thinking about these fine tunings, which was 30 odd years ago, um, one of the explanations of course was maybe there's a fine tuner for obviously people of a theological disposition saw this as evidence maybe for a creator. You know that God had a choice of how he was going to choose all the coupling constants and he essentially chose the values that would produce us. So that was a, the theological explanation and of course that's why I think most physicists found the idea of these anthropic tunings rather uncomfortable. I'd say appalling. A appalling because of course it, they the last thing most physicists want to do is to, is to invoke God. Um, there were other explanations, for example, there was the idea that maybe the development of consciousness itself allows you to collapse the wave function of the universe so it comes into existence. So the idea would be that the universe starts with a big bang, but until consciousness has developed and it can sort of reflect back on the origin of the universe, 
it, the universe doesn't really exist in a proper, well-defined state. Yeah, it has, it's sort of a retro-causation in a quantum mechanical It's way. a quantum mechanical idea which, which assumes that in some sense consciousness collapses the wave function, but, but that's also to most physicists a rather yeah. a mystical explanation. Um, so then when the idea of a multiverse came along, that was regarded as making the discussion of the anthropic fine-tunings respectable <laughs> from a physicist perspective right, because right. at least a physicist could say that well this is predicted by theories of physics in some particular M and theory. nothing supernatural no god it, no it doesn't involve god it doesn't involve anything supernatural and therefore this is a natural way of explaining these these fine tuning so um, in other words it's a way of, of avoiding any Design. You're basically using the multiverse to explain these coincidences without having to say there has to be. Uh, a are you comfortable with that explanation? Well, the f funny thing is, when I first got interested in this subject, I, f I found myself in a rather schizophrenic state. I, I, I wrote a, a review article with Martin Rees in 1979, which got quite a lot of attention on these fine tunings in the anthropic principle. And I would spend um, some of my time talking to theologians because they were interested in this. And when I spoke to them, I would sort of tend to say, well, yes, it could be a, you know, it could be a, a fine tuner. But then I would spend my time giving physics seminars and saying to the physicists, well, um, you know, we, even then we talked about, we didn't use the word multiverse, but we used the idea that there were other, other universes and saying, you don't need to have a theological explanation. So personally, I always found myself in a little bit of a schizophrenic mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. From the point of view of physics now, there's no doubt about it that it's the introduction of the multiverse which has made it permissible to talk about the anthropic fine tunings without getting into too much trouble. But I have to, I have to be sound a note of caution there because it's also true that quite a lot of physicists regard the idea of the multiverse as, as also rather metaphysical. And, um, and, and indeed, some people have argued that the idea of the multiverse and the idea of God are, are, are just as mysterious, and <laughs> just as remote from science. And my own view is that uh, the multiverse should be regarded as, as part of science, but it, it does depend on precisely what you mean by science. To me, the issue is not whether multiverses exist, the question is whether the speculations about the multiverse are actually part of science. And the fact of the matter is that under the present, our present concept of science, it probably wouldn't count as science because of the problems of not being able to see these other universes or not being able to, to test the hypothesis. But my view is very much that the nature of science itself does evolve. I mean, the nature of science has always changed and what we think is an essential feature of science uh, may not be an essential feature of science tomorrow. And uh, the whole of astronomy is based on, you know, originally it was assumed that science had to involve experiments. The whole of astronomy is based on the fact you can't do experiments. You can't do experiments with stars and galaxies. You can just observe them. The problem, of course, with multiverse is that you're talking about the existence of other worlds, other universes, which you can't see directly. And so people say, therefore, if I can't see these other universes, it's not part of science. But the trouble is, we're, <coughs> we're used to the idea, in, in physics at least, that certain things are real but can't be seen. Like quarks, we can never see a quark, but we still believe in QCD. We can't see the, the inside of a black hole, but we still believe in black holes. So <coughs> the idea is that... So pull it all together. Pull it all together and, and, and what is your overview? Give me a, a final conclusion. Well, my overview is that although you can't see these other universes, you still have indirect evidence for their reality. And that may partly come from the indirect evidence for the theories which predict them, like M theory. But to me, actually, the prime evidence for the multiverse is to me the fine tunings. Because to me, that is the, the mystery which needs to be explained.